In this video, I'm going to talk about HTML and CSS, why you need to know of them as a data journalist, um, some basics in terms of both of those and how they different, uh, differ from each other, and also how you can use code playgrounds to play around with them. Now, um, HTML is actually quite a simple language. It's very easy to recognize. It basically consists of um, text, pure text, and tags like these, which control uh, how that text is interpreted by the browser, and in particular, what it means. Um, here, for example, you can see some of the most common tags. You can recognize a HTML tag by the triangular brackets that surround it. These are often called chevrons. And um, you can see here, for example, these just these 11 tags are um, enough to make up the, the majority of HTML web pages. The HTML tag at the top is the very first tag on um, HTML pages, and it basically says everything after this tag is HTML. It should be interpreted in that way. The head tag is used to contain any information about the document. So in other words, things like the author, um, any keywords, uh, anything else that's invisible in terms of the contents of the page. So the title of the page would be contained within the head tag using the title tag. Anything that's visible on a page should be within the body tag. So the body of a HTML page is all the visible elements. And then there are tags like A, which creates uh, a link. Um, we have the image tag, which you will need if you want to add an image. Um, the script tag for JavaScript, for example. Um, the meta tag has metadata about the page. That would also be in the head tag. So some of these tags will be inside other tags as well. And really, the situation where you're going to come across these is likely to be not where you're creating HTML from scratch, but rather if you're in a situation where you've been given something that's in HTML and you want to customize it a little, or you're trying to fix a, a small problem, or for example, you're scraping a web page and you need to be able to target HTML within that because you want the information contained within that HTML. So it's useful to know what different HTML tags mean, just some of them, and how it works, how it's constructed. Not necessarily enough to be able to create web pages from scratch yourself, unless that's the sort of data journalism you want to pursue. Just to cover some more common HTML tags, um, UL will create an unordered list, in other words, a bullet list. LI will create a list item within that. P will create a paragraph. BR will create a break, a kind of like a carriage return between two lines. H2 and H1 and H3 are three of the most common heading sizes. So these will create headings at level one, two, and three. And if you might be able to guess that there's also H4, H5, and H6 if you want uh, headings which are less important in the hierarchy of the structure of a page. You've got tags like iframe, which are often used to embed content. They essentially create a window onto quite often a visualization, a chart or a map, for example, or YouTube. All of these embeds often start with an iframe tag. There are tags here to create buttons, headers and footers, navigation, um, forms where you can input details as well. So those are some of the most common HTML tags and what they look like. It's also worth being aware of a couple of other pieces of jargon, uh, in particular, the idea of attributes and values. So in this slide, you can see two tags, the tag image or IMG and the A tag. Um, the image tag, as, you, as we've already said, um, creates an image and the A tag creates a link. However, both these tags uh, need some extra information in order to do that properly. So the A tag, for example, to create a link, you need to specify where this link is going to go to when someone clicks on it. And to do that, you need to give it an attribute, specifically the href attribute, the hyperlink reference. So in this example below, the hyperlink reference attribute has a value of index.html. Uh, an attribute is always assigned a value with an equal sign followed by the value 
um, in quotations in, in this particular example. So that means that when someone clicks on that link, it's going to look for a page at that address um, in the same location as the file, the document that contains this code. The image tag pretty much always needs a source attribute, SRC, for the source of the image. Where am I going to load this image from if I'm a browser reading this HTML? And again, this is a file location. So in this case, it's looking in an images folder for, for an image called myhead.com jpg. Um, now tags can have more than one attribute so it, with an image tag for example you might have a source attribute but also a width attribute, a height attribute, a border attribute each of which specifies um, in, the, in that case numerical attributes, pixels, things like that. Uh, with the a attribute uh, tag, you can have a um, target attribute which specifies whether the link is opened in a new window or not, and so on. You can have the no follow attribute which tells search engines not to follow it. But fundamentally, it's worth understanding this idea that uh, quite a lot of HTML tags will also have attributes and values. And that can be quite useful, partly because it allows you to target them more specifically if you're doing things like scraping or if you're creating something interactive with JavaScript which wants to target particular tags. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, this idea of targeting. The other thing to realize is that only the tag is closed when something is turned off. So for example, when you want to make something a link, you um, use the A tag before the text that you want to affect, the, the text that you want to be turned into a link. Um, and you might have something like ahref equals um, index.html, then you um, close the triangular bracket for some text which is now turned into a link, and then eventually you'll turn that link off by having a, a tag with backslash A to turn that tag off. So tags are turned on and off. Uh, to make a, a word bold, you would use the strong tag before it and then backslash strong after it. Uh, so it's like switching on the bold and then switching it off. At the top of a HTML document, the first tag is uh, the HTML tag and then at the bottom the last one is backslash HTML to indicate the end of that HTML document. And they're turned off and on uh, in order and in reverse order. So for example, if you wanted to make something bold and then italic, you would then turn off italic first and bold second. So you would turn them off in reverse order. Another piece of jargon to be aware of is the difference between block level uh, elements in HTML and what are called inline elements. Um, an inline element is just that, it's within the line, within a, a particular line, uh, a sentence of text for example, and A is one of those, so you, you're only going to make one word or a few words inside a paragraph uh, into a link, you're not going to make the whole block into a link, and span as well. And uh, a good example to illustrate this is the difference between div and span and um, an opportunity here really to discuss a bit more about those and what they do because these are less obvious than some of the other tags in terms of what they're for. Both of these are really just ways of splitting up parts of a HTML page um, for, for the reasons of functionality. You might want to do something different with, with these different parts, or they might have some sort of different meaning. You might divide a page into different divs for the um, main content, for um, different stories, different jobs, in a job listings, uh, things like that. Uh, span is used to split up parts of text. So span is an inline uh, element. It, it only applies to a, a part of a sentence or, or um, not the whole block, whereas div is the whole block. And to illustrate this, you can see in these two examples, we've got um, some blue background colouring applied. Um, I wouldn't recommend using this, by the way. This is just for the purposes of illustration. This is considered um, pretty bad practice to apply a style in this way, as we'll come on to. But what we have here is if you apply a background colour to a div, it applies to the whole block. So it carries on right to the edge of this page, for example. 
A span with the same background color only applies it to the, the text for words in that sentence. So that's the difference between inline and block and also the difference between divs and spans. Now let's move on to style then and cascading style sheets or CSS. Now the difference between HTML and CSS is the difference between the content of a web page and what that content means and what it looks like, how it's presented, what's the style. So there is a HTML tag called M which will emphasize uh, a piece of text. The, the result of that looks like italic text. It will, uh, by default, it will make the text angled and italic. However, the M tag is, um, strictly speaking, all it's supposed to be doing is telling the browser that this text is emphasized, not italic. And in fact, this tag used to be I. It used to be the letter I for italic and there used to be a bold tag as well, which was B for bold. And they actually changed these to, if you like, to, to draw attention to the fact that these were not supposed to be about style, they were supposed to be about meaning. So, for example, if a screen reader is reading out text on a page and it encounters text within the M tag, it will emphasise the words within it in the way that, that the tone of a screen reader reads out the words for a, for a user who's blind, for example. So HTML should only be used to specify the meaning of text. Um, another example would be headings. H1 indicates that the text inside the H1 tag is a first level heading, the most important type of heading on the page. H2 would indicate it's the second most important level of heading. So you might use H1 for the title of a page as a whole or possibly the headline of a story and you might use H2 for a subheading. Um, now again, by default, the browser will display a H1 tag as being larger and bolder than a H2 tag, but that's just a byproduct. And actually, uh, if you want to make headlines bigger or text bigger, then you should use style to do that, uh, particularly if, it, it, if the meaning of it isn't any different. So headings mean something, whereas size and emphasis, uh, you know, the way that something looks, is a question of style. And that's where we move on to CSS. Normally a, a web page is created with HTML in terms of its content and meaning, and then CSS is added to style it. The other thing about CSS is that it will also style it differently or can style it differently depending on whether someone is accessing it through different platforms, mobile, tablet, um, desktop, or if they're printing it, you can have print style sheets as well. Now, in terms of using CSS, there are three different ways of um, using it. HTML is within the actual page. It's a HTML page. It actually ends in .html. It's full of HTML code. But often the, the CSS isn't inside the HTML page. It's in an external document, an external file called a style sheet. And that's the most common way that CSS is applied. At some point inside your HTML um, web pages head tags, there would be some sort of link to that style sheet. A second way that you can apply CSS is to have a style sheet actually um, inside the head tags of the HTML page. So you would write all the styles inside there. And a third way would be actually inside a tag, which is what uh, we did here with style equals. So this is saying apply this, this background color to this div. And that's generally frowned upon because you, you're kind of mixing CSS and HTML. And also it's very inefficient. You would have to do that for every single uh, tag that you wanted to style. And normally style sheets are applied across a whole website, which is another reason why they're normally in a linked style sheet. They're used um, to apply a style to a whole whole website and then you can change that style sheet and the whole website now will be styled differently instead of having to change thousands or millions of web pages individually. And this is the sort of structure you're going to have. You've got your HTML document there in the middle. Any CSS normally is in a separate file um, and you can see on the right here an example of the 
um, HTML which links to that CSS file. So we have the link tag with the rel attribute saying that this is a style sheet uh, and the type attribute saying the same and then a href attribute which specifies the location of this file and there's some more uh, another attribute as well here. So this is the sort of HTML that might link to another an external CSS file. And this is again useful for kind of understanding HTML pages that you might be working with and how they're structured in relation to other documents. At this point, we're moving outside of a document to other files that might contain some information that we're looking for. Equally, um, a JavaScript file would be hosted separately normally and the code for that might look like this in the HTML. And then you've got other documents like CSV or JSON files if you if there's data being pulled in. Um, and again, these would be stored separately as would images and video and audio. Now the cascading part of cascading style sheets is that these styles within the style sheet, a style sheet can have lots of different styles. Um, these styles are applied in a cascading fashion. So uh, if you do have an external style sheet and you also have internal styles, then the internal styles, if there's any conflict, then the internal styles override the external ones. Likewise, if it was an inline style that would, which conflicted with any of the other styles, the inline style would win. The closest you are to the actual content that's being styled, then the, the, the more superior, if you, if you like, that style is, it wins out. Equally, um, styles are applied to individual tags, as we'll come on to. And in an example here where you might have a div tag, and then within that you've got a p tag, and within that you've got a span tag. If it was a style applied to each of those tags, then the span style would win if there was any conflict. So let's say the style said that divs should have a blue background, and p's should have a red background, and span should have a yellow background. The end result would be a yellow background for this span uh, because it would apply them in turn and the yellow style, the yellow background would be applied last and would therefore override the others. So that's the cascading part of it. Now this is what CSS looks like. Um, what we have is a tag essentially but not in triangular brackets. And when it's not in triangular brackets and it's inside CSS, it's called a selector. So this is targeting any H1 tags in our HTML document. And then it's followed by the rules of um, how this tag should be styled. So in other words, it's saying if there's any H1 tags in this document, style them in the following way. Apply this background, apply this color to the text, and apply this font size. These are called property value pairs. Uh, the property comes before a colon and the value comes after it, very similar to the attribute value uh, pairs that we looked at with HTML tags. If there's more than one, then you'll have a semicolon between each to separate them and they'll all be within these curly brackets that come after the selector. Again, the selector is the same as the tag. Um, now you can have a number of different selectors. So if I had, if here it said H1 and then a space and then A, what that would mean is it was targeting that combination of tags. So in other words, any uh, A tag within a H1 tag. So you can have multiple um, selectors to, to specify a combination of tags and you can even specify tags with certain properties, certain attributes or certain attributes with certain values as well. And these, this sort of selection is also sometimes used in scraping as I mentioned and it's often used in JavaScript interactivity as well so you might target a tag to behave a certain way with JavaScript which is another reason to, to understand some of these concepts around how CSS and HTML work. While I'm um, showing you that piece of code, you, you may have noticed these two series of, of digits um, 
that uh, a hash comes before, a hash precedes. These are called hexadecimal codes if you've not encountered them before. And again, you'll probably come across these quite often as a way of colouring text and backgrounds and other elements inside um, HTML and, and, and CSS. Um, and particularly in visualization, so it's worth being familiar with these. A hexadecimal code is called a hexadecimal code because you've got these um, six alphanumeric characters and they run from um, the letters A, uh, sorry, 0 to 9 and then A to F. So um, 0 to 9 is the first 10 and then A to F is another 6. So you've got 16, the 16 potential characters for each position in these six um, characters. And the first two refer to the amount of red, the second two to the amount of green, and then last two to the amount of blue that is mixed to create the colour that you're seeing. So this, uh, this particular colour, for example, has zero red, and I won't get into how much um, green and blue this means, but uh, that's certainly one thing that we can say about this. Uh, this is a good example. We've got zero green and zero blue, and we've got some red, which creates this colour here. So that's a hexadecimal colour. And quite often, if you want a consistent colour palette in your design, it's worth picking a few hexadecimal colours and making a note of the values and using them in your design. Quite often, if you're working in an organisation, they will have specific hexadecimal codes that are used to ensure that colour is used consistently in their work. So let's move on now to where you can play around with some of this. Um, and these are often called code playgrounds. Uh, websites like CodePen, JS Fiddle, CSS Deck are places where you can play around with some of this code to um, see how it works, uh, to break it, to um, problem solve and so on. So I want to finish off by talking a little bit about those. Again, I want to emphasize that when you're working with HTML or with web pages, the HTML uh, file is a separate file to the CSS and to the JavaScript most of the time and indeed to other material as well. And CodePen, which is what I'm going to focus on here, mirrors that structure. When you create uh, an account on CodePen and you create a pen, uh, which is a, a place to play with code, your screen will normally be split into three parts, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript. And when at the end, when you've exported the results of playing around, uh, you can export this as three different files that are linked to each other. So um, in some of the uh, material for this uh, week and for this module on, on Moodle and on GitHub, you'll find examples on CodePen, for example, this example, which um, has some examples of interactivity that you can look at how it's been made and you can try to kind of reverse engineer some of the code involved. So in this example, we can see we've got a, some HTML for a table. We've got no CSS really, and we've got some JavaScript which makes this table interactive. And um, you might be able to see, for example, um, that this table has an ID attribute of my table in the HTML. And then in the JavaScript, you can see that my table appearing again. So um, without getting into too much detail, I can point out to you that what this means is that that table is being targeted. And actually the hash sign, which I haven't mentioned before, the hash sign is a way of saying ID. So this basically means ID my table. It's a way of selecting an ID attribute with a value of my table. Um, and in terms of the, the uh, settings on a pen as well, um, it's worth pointing out that you can bring in external style sheets. You might find uh, style sheets around the web. For example, there's a tutorial on GitHub about creating an interactive table using data tables. And data tables has a CSS, uh, a CSS style sheet that you can copy and paste in the settings. And it has some JavaScript, two JavaScript libraries that it uses, which you can also put in the settings. Um, if you haven't dealt with JavaScript yet, don't worry about this for now, but I just want to show you how you can bring in external style sheets 
and uh, JavaScript libraries into CodePen. It'd be basically going to the settings and then go under CSS or JavaScript and paste accordingly. So I mentioned some of the stuff on GitHub. Uh, one of the things you can uh, play around with is this introduction to Bootstrap, which is a responsive web design framework, and you can find a tutorial on that on um, GitHub. So just to wrap up some of the key points from this video, first of all, HTML and CSS are about content and style respectively. The HTML file is should really be purely the content of your web page and what it means in terms of whether it's important or not, um, whether it's a division of the page or navigation, whether, uh, a link or so on. HTML is purely about content. The style in terms of how that content is presented is controlled by CSS and the, the behavior of that may well be controlled by JavaScript as well. Secondly, um, why are we talking about this? Well, it's not so you can design web pages. It's basically because it's quite likely in your work as a data journalist that you will come across some HTML or some CSS and you will need to either customize it in some way. So if you've um, if some visualization tool has generated some HTML and CSS that you want to customize or if you want to target it in some way, particularly if you're writing a scraper or if you're writing some something interactive and it needs to be able to target elements on the page in order to make them behave in a certain way. So having a little bit of basic understanding about how they work and how they differ, what they look like, will help you deal with some of these situations and basically Google around the problem. You can use trial and error and code playgrounds to test out ideas. Um, but knowing a little bit helps you be more confident in searching around a problem and understanding some of the possibilities in order to achieve that.